My name is Stephen Erlanger. I'm the London Bureau Chief for the New York Times. Welcome to you all in this stunning setting. Um, it's really quite lovely. Unfortunately, Mr. Stone, you can't be here with us, except um, visually. Um, and um, we have about 45 minutes, and um, I hope this will go well. Um, we, you're in the middle. Uh, Mr. Snowden, of, of an interesting moment for you. You're, in a way, the virtual star of a movie. There's a big campaign going on to try to get President Obama to amnesty you in some fashion before the end of his time in office. And sitting next to me, as I hope you can see, is Ken Roth, who's the executive director of Human Rights Watch, which has been one of the main organizers with the American Civil Liberties Union and Amnesty International in pressing for this amnesty. So the first thing, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to ask you, I mean, for many people, you're a whistleblowing hero. And for many other people, you're a traitor who broke your oath and betrayed your country. And for a lot of people, you're probably some combination of the two. So I, I just wanted to ask you in the most open way, having knowingly broken the law for reasons you've explained and fled the jurisdiction of the American courts, why should you be granted asylum? Well, first I would say that the question of whether or not uh, I should be granted a pardon is not for me to answer. Uh, I'm not actually asking for pardon myself because I think the whole point of our system, the foundation of our democracy, the system of checks and balances, uh, central to that is the idea that no single individual should have an outsized influence uh, in our, our uh, discussions about how the system should work. Now, I sought to replicate this uh, in the series of disclosures uh, that I partner with journalists uh, to achieve in 2013. Uh, what I mean by this uh, is that even though I had very strong feelings uh, about the fact that the NSA's system of global mass surveillance uh, was unlawful, it was unconstitutional. And eventually the courts did uh, agree with me there, they vindicated me, and found these programs had never been authorized by law and they needed to be ended. Uh, Congress affirmed that when they changed the law, uh, putting new restrictions on the intelligence community's powers for the first time in more than 40 years. Uh, and even the President of the United States said this conversation has made us stronger as a nation, uh, despite the fact that he can't condone uh, what I did, which is understandable. But how does this get into that system of checks and balances? Well, the idea here is that even I believed quite strongly about I have never published a single document on my own. Uh, rather partnered with journalists, uh, some of the res most respected names in news, uh, outlets such as uh, the Washington Post, The Guardian, uh, The New York Times, of course, has also published stories from the archive, uh, reporting for which these groups received the Pulitzer Prize for public service. Uh, now, why did I do that? Uh, again, it gets back to the idea that while I had these strong opinions, I felt that they should be reduced uh, because I could be wrong, I could be some crazy person, uh, and of course, I was not elected. Who am I to make these decisions? Uh, but this is why we have the free press in a democracy. Uh, and this is really what makes our First Amendment so powerful and such a model for the world. The government, yes, uh, has many great powers, uh, particularly as they relate to uh, handling, the handling of state secrets. But it is the press that is the foremost institution within our societies uh, charged with determining what information is truly within the public interest to know. I mean, if, and it's if, for that reason, sorry, uh, that I said, uh, please guys, make an independent editorial judgment uh, that I was not incorrect here, uh, that these things are useful, and to hold back what's not, to give the government a chance to rebut uh, those journalists' uh, judgment, the editor's judgment, uh, perhaps and have the whole picture, perhaps they, they missed some detail, uh, so that they wouldn't put someone at risk. And that's why three years later, we can see that no individual has come to harm result. Now, in the pardon case, uh, how this relates, 
is that I'm incredibly grateful uh, and fortunate to be able to experience the support of the world's three leading human rights uh, organizations, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and ACLU. Uh, but as to making the... Yeah, we're frozen. Sorry, we have a technical glitch. Apologies to everybody. You all knew this was going to happen once. Right? Forgive me, it seems we've had a small break in connectivity there. Uh, Athens, your microphone is showing as being muted uh, in the system. Could someone working the software please unmute that so um, we can hear on the stream? Can you hear me? They can hear you. But, but, but can Mr. Snowden hear me? Uh, it's in the old style where? Um, Mr. Snowden, can you hear me now? Uh, we can. Thank okay, you. great. So, I mean, what I was going to ask you anyway was just press you a moment. Um, uh, Daniel Ellsberg is probably a similar analog to your case, a whistleblower, um, but he did, um, he was also charged under the Espionage Act, um, but he did f at least put himself forward or was put forward for trial. I mean, part of the, the history of civil disobedience is being willing to take um, whatever punishment comes for the, for the moral act of standing up against authority. So I would just ask you, in, in that context, why would you not return to face a jury um, in America? rather than well, remain you for stuck asking. in Russia, which, you know, is hardly your perfect state. <laughs> of course. Well, the most important thing to say there first is that I never chose to be in Russia. Uh, in fact, I was seeking asylum in a third country uh, when the United States canceled my passport when they heard that I had left Hong Kong. Yes. Uh, when I arrived in Moscow, I could no longer travel internationally. I applied for asylum in more than 21 different countries around the world, uh, primarily within Western Europe. Uh, and unfortunately, we're still waiting to hear back because every time uh, one of those countries gets close, uh, their phones start to ring in the State Department. Uh, but to the central question, uh, which is a, a very intriguing question, and I think it's an important one for everyone uh, to grapple with, uh, is why have things changed since Daniel Ellsberg? Uh, and is it still civil disobedience? Well, Daniel Ellsberg himself uh, has argued that I made the right decision uh, not to sort of present myself uh, to the court under Espionage Act charges uh, because things have changed since the 1970s. Uh, today, uh, you are not allowed uh, by law uh, to make a defense in front of the jury against the Espionage Act charges. Uh, that is a public interest defense or what's called a whistleblower defense. Uh, I am legally prohibited from even speaking uh, to the jury uh, about my motivation. Uh, and this brings up a central question of can there be a fair trial uh, when you can't put forward a defense? Uh, now, some would argue, uh, critics from the government would say, well, yes, it's true. You can't tell a jury why you did what you did. And it's true that the trial phase uh, is not actually fair in its procedures. But at the sentencing phase, you can tell the judge uh, why you did what you did. But that's not very democratic. Uh, the whole point of the jury system is that you can actually discuss with your peers uh, not only what you did, the facts of what you did, uh, but is the law itself correct? Is it appropriate? I mean, uh, presuming you would have a lawyer who, who could express your point of view. No. no. Uh, no, no. And, uh, and maybe Ken, Ken can come in here as a former prosecutor yes. and 
explain a bit to both of us and, and, and to the audience listening? Because it, it is, what, 1917 Espionage Act? Yeah, and Mr. Snowden is absolutely correct. The Under the Espionage Act, which, yes, is from 1917, you are not allowed to present a public interest or a whistleblower defense. So, you know, neither Mr. Snowden nor his lawyer would be able to argue to the jury that Mr. Snowden was justified in breaking the law. And what this effectively does, there's a concept in the law known as jury nullification. And frankly, it's a lot of why we have a jury system. Um, even if you know the law applies in most cases, a jury is basically capable of saying, no, we, we don't think the law should apply here. We're not going to follow the law. We're not going to convict this individual because we think the law is unjust in this case. And by precluding Mr. Snow nor anybody charged under the Espionage Act with bringing forth a whistleblower defense, um, that prospect of jury nullification is voided. It's not there. So all he can do is at the sentencing stages argue in mitigation of a heavy sentence that he was justified. But that's very different from being acquitted. Thank you, Ken. Um, what I was going to ask you, Mr. Stoughton, um, Ellsberg has said that you had told him that you'd be willing to serve two or three years as part of um, a part of a plea bargain deal before you came back to the United States. First of all, is that true? Um, how, um, I mean, and how do you come up with this idea of two or three years if, in fact, that's, that's what you said? Yeah, I, I don't think a, a particular specific figure was ever mentioned. Uh, that wouldn't really be something for me to come up with again. That would be something that uh, my, my legal team would be better positioned to discuss. Uh, but to, to get back real quick to your, your central question, which we actually didn't quite get to, which was about is it civil disobedience and what is civil disobedience? Uh, how does it work? What is the purpose, particularly in the context of heavy sentences? And I think this is something that people uh, have become a little bit divorced from with history because civil disobedience isn't quite so frequent as it once was. And we have to ask ourselves why. Uh, the one who many consider to be the father of civil disobedience, uh, who would be uh, Henry David Thoreau, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, he famously went to prison for not paying his poll tax. Uh, and it was in this context that he wrote uh, his book, Civil Disobedience. Uh, but how long was he in jail for? Does anyone in the audience remember? Uh, it was for one day. He spent one day in prison for his act of protest. And then he was able to communicate his ideas to the whole of society to actually achieve an effective change. Uh, the most important point here is that it is the disobedience part of the phrase civil disobedience that is the most important uh, when we're talking about democratic change and actually achieving uh, a result. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, when he wrote his letter from Birmingham, uh, does anyone remember how long he was spending in prison? I, I believe it was 11 days, uh, perhaps 19 days, somewhere in that time frame. The idea here behind civil disobedience uh, in the, the traditional sense, uh, where you deliver yourself onto prison to make a very public demonstration that the law is unjust, is to activate mass participation. If uh, we are asking uh, our dissidents to stand up and volunteer not for uh, a day in jail, a few weeks in jail, a month in jail, maybe even a year in jail, but are instead asking them to make their point with the rest of their lives in jail. Is that really a way, a mechanism that today we will encourage other people to stand up and emulate that? Or are we asking for martyrs uh, rather than protest? Um, you find yourself, of course, in a very strange limbo. Um, you never, as you said, meant to stay in Russia. Russia has kind of used you as a kind of propaganda instrument, whether you wanted them to or not, um, to show how generous they are in comparison with 
the United States. Um, and the symbolism of your fleeing first to China and then to Russia really enrages some people. I'm not sure that you ending up in Ecuador or Venezuela would have looked much better. So I just wanted to ask you, do you have any regrets about those choices? Uh, no, because again, these weren't choices uh, that really I put together. It's quite clear if you watch Citizen Four uh, or even the film that opens today uh, that I didn't really have an act for action plan because this was never about me. It wasn't what happened uh, to me. My whole intention was to return this information to public hands through the journalists. Uh, after that, it was very much cobbled together. There's been recent reporting uh, discussing how I stayed uh, during the underground period with refugees. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, my target at that time was actually Iceland. Uh, and uh, again, while I was in the airport in Russia, uh, I appealed to many other countries. When you ask this question, uh, is it best for me to be in Russia? Uh, this, again, is not really a question for me to answer because I don't have the authority, I don't have the power uh, to enter these other countries, but rather to ask perhaps the audience in Greece uh, or in Germany or France or Great Britain or any of our other allies, when US policy uh, has entered a situation in which they are constrained by appearances. Uh, they must take a position of being tough uh, because they're trying to create a deterrent effect uh, or whatever. Is it truly an act uh, of hostility for our allied countries, for example, Germany, uh, to welcome a whistleblower and say, we won't extradite this individual uh, to the United States because it would be a violation of international law? Uh, or is that actually an act of friendship uh, because they are mediating a situation uh, and finding a better result, a kind of bridge uh, between our worlds? Uh, Ken, you have an opinion on that? Well, it would be a better result for you, certainly. Um, I'm not sure what benefit it would necessarily bring Germany. What benefit would it bring Germany? From my perspective, uh, again, I don't have very strong opinions on this because I, I don't think it's my place to say this, but it's been argued uh, by many uh, that the idea is that Germany is a country uh, that supports human rights. Uh, they pride themselves on taking a prominent position uh, in the defense of them. Uh, and Europe more broadly has positioned itself as sort of a global uh, advocate for the progress of human rights. Uh, these kind of situations, and again, let's stop talking about me, but let's start talking about whistleblowing in general. Uh, we need mechanisms for international arbitration of such claims. Uh, no country, regardless of whether it's the United States or China or France, uh, is going to be very forgiving uh, when one of their citizens has revealed them to be breaking very serious laws, prohibitions against the violations of human rights. Uh, and if countries can say, look, we're not taking sides here, we're simply adhering to the law, and there's no question that the Espionage Act, uh, as defined under the international law context, uh, is considered the quintessential political crime, and political crimes are exempt from extradition, uh, that we go, let's stop talking about the rhetoric and let's start talking about the facts. Uh, let's everybody cool down and start talking about how we can cooperate and build better defenses, build better systems, so that we don't have uh, these big points of contention in the future and things are a little bit more predictable. Come in here. Yeah, I'd like to just follow up on, you know, why would it be in Germany's interest, say, or, or you know, some European country's interest to grant Mr. Snowden asylum? And, uh, you know, Mr. Snowden is so much better able to address, you know, technically what he disclosed. But let me in, in, in try to reduce it to two legal points to help you understand what's really at stake here. 
Uh, until Mr. Snowden's disclosure, the US government essentially was operating under two theories to justify its invasion of privacy. One is that with respect to our metadata, that is to say, um, not the content of our communications, but rather who you call, who you email, um, et cetera, which reveals a lot of information. The US government's position was that we have no right to privacy in any of that metadata because we shared it with the internet company or the phone company. Um, now, one of the great consequences of Mr. Stone's disclosures is that um, the U.S. has backed off that theory a little bit. It hasn't necessarily given up the legal theory, but in practice it has ratcheted down a little bit. The other big claim is that with respect to the contents of your communication, what you say on the phone, what you write in your email, the U.S. government recognized a right to privacy for U.S. citizens or for non-U.S. citizens in the United States. But if you are a non-U.S. citizen outside the United States, the U.S. takes the view that it can, without inhibition, read your emails and listen to your phone conversations. And that is a position that it maintains to this day. Now, interestingly, Germany and Brazil have taken the lead at the international level in trying to get you know, some kind of international understanding that would reverse that American view. But this is very much a battle underway. So it, it, there's a bit of um, you know, hypocrisy here for Germany to be on the one hand, accepting the validity of the theory you know, that we're trying to oppose with respect to the United States, but not put um, in practice the principles by, by granting asylum to Mr. Snowden, who made it possible for us to even have this conversation, because until then, we didn't know the full extent that our, our privacy was being invaded. Thank you, Ken. Um, Mr. Snowden, I, I mean, you've you said in the beginning, and you've said in other places, I mean, there are uh, factual things that have changed because of your revelations that have improved matters, you think. Could you, I mean, is it your concern that governments are actually doing whatever they want to do by other means? I mean, have but the improvements that, that you feel you've inspired, are you worried they're simply transitory or um, temporary? Um, or do you think they've had permanent effect? And if so, how? Well, I, I think the, the central point uh, here to get at is, do I think things are fixed? Uh, no. Um, do I think that any whistleblower, any single individual uh, can sort of change the world and fix all of the problems? No, I think that's asking too much. Uh, the question is more, have things improved in a concrete way? Uh, and have, is, is the dynamic uh, something that we can have some influence on now? And I think that's very much the case. Uh, it's very true that if you look at uh, legislatures around the world, uh, many structures of law are getting worse. In the United States, we have made some initial reforms. That's very valuable. Uh, we have seen in Europe uh, some things such as the, uh, the previous safe harbor agreement, uh, where European companies sort of gave all of their citizens' datas to, data to uh, U.S. companies uh, without any controls or without any guarantees uh, of how that would be handled. Uh, was struck down by the uh, European courts. I believe the European Court of Justice, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong there, Ken. Um, this has been replaced, uh, allegedly, with the uh, Privacy Shield Agreement, which is supposed to be a little bit of an improvement. Uh, I would argue that things haven't uh, actually changed in fact there, and that's a little bit of a feel-good uh, change that will not survive uh, appellate review as it works its way up the courts, because the U.S. hasn't resolved its fundamental problem, which is what uh, Ken was sort of uh, touching upon earlier, which is the U.S. has right now a two-tiered system of handling uh, surveillance. If you're a U.S. citizen, uh, they'll go to a court to get a warrant before they spy on you. Uh, now, this is almost always a secret court uh, called the FISA court, which uh, in 33 years was asked roughly 34,000 times to authorize surveillance and only said no 11 times in those uh, roughly 33, 34 years. Uh, they're a rubber stamp. But if you're not a U.S. citizen, uh, no warrant is required at all. Uh, in most cases. Uh, that's gotten a little bit better because some companies uh, have actually begun uh, resisting these demands. They've uh, required a, a higher sort of burden of evidence before they share customers' data. And yes, this is uncomfortable for some governments, uh, but there's no question 
uh, that this is a very, very positive thing uh, in terms of the protection of rights uh, and the enforcement of due process around the world. I wanted to get your reaction. You've probably seen it, but there's a man named Stuart Baker who, who had been a former general counsel for the National Security Agency who's against a pardon for you. But what he said, and I'm curious what you think, he, he said he thought the benefits of the leaks, which were real, could have been achieved by leaking only three or four documents and the public benefits of, of, of the revelations, in his opinion, uh, lasted for a while. They prompted a genuine debate, but that in the end, in the years since then, the um, massive flood, quote, unleashed by Snowden, has been used to harm US intelligence and national interest. So what I just wanted to ask you, I mean, is there something to, his suggestion that if you'd leaked less, you might have had the same effect? I mean, I know you don't believe you've caused irreparable harm to US intelligence, um, but do you have any worries in your heart of hearts, because things have moved on since you've been isolated, um, that in fact there might be some element of truth to that? Uh, no, but let's preface this a little bit. Uh, first off, Stuart Baker is, is fairly well known for being one of the wackier critics uh, in terms of uh, national security punditry. Uh, but let's presume uh, in good faith that he's absolutely right. Uh, he's not, but let's presume he are, was for the sake of argument. Uh, what he's actually arguing here uh, is not against me, uh, it's against journalism. He's criticizing the journalists who are continuing to report on the archive uh, and continuing to break stories that are actually changing uh, law and policy today still. Uh, and this is uncomfortable for people from that perspective uh, that believe in very expansive, very authoritarian interpretations of state power. Uh, now. What does this mean when we're saying that uh, journalists, it's okay if they run the first three stories, but after they run the next three or the next 30 or the next 300, that's too much. They need to stop. Who makes that decision? Uh, should it be uh, former national security officials such as Stuart Baker, uh, or should that be uh, the newspapers uh, and the press uh, more broadly? I believe uh, that it should be the press. They're the best place uh, to make those decisions, and that's why we have the First Amendment. Um, I'm certainly with you there. Um, can I also ask you, I mean, you've said you don't speak a lot of Russian, I and mean, it's not a place you particularly wanted to be. I mean, I know you can roam around Russia as much as you like, and having been based there myself, there's a lot of interesting things there. Um, but what do you do all day? I mean, do you kind of sit in front of the computer? I mean, do you go to a gym? I mean, what do you do? I think people <laughs> want to know. I speak at conferences in Athens, mostly. <laughs> it's an income. Yeah, no, but, but seriously, I've always been sort of an indoor cat, right? My life has been the internet. And perhaps this is an explanation uh, for why I was so moved by what I witnessed at the NSA, right? Uh, what we saw in 2013 wasn't just about surveillance. Uh, that's sort of the the reflexive reading of it at the surface level, but when we look a little bit more deeply, uh, it's actually about rights, uh, and more broadly, it's about democracy. Uh, people talk about privacy, uh, and they don't really understand what privacy means. Uh, when they think privacy, they think they're Facebook settings, right? Uh, but privacy is the fountainhead of all of our rights. Fountain, or Privacy is the right from which all others are derived, because privacy is what makes you an individual. Privacy is what gives you the protection of the self. Privacy is the right to an independent mind uh, and an independent life. Freedom of speech, for example, doesn't have that much meaning if you don't have the protected space uh, to decide what it is that you actually think, what it is that you actually want to say. Uh, the same for freedom of religion. Uh, 
if you can't decide for yourself uh, what you want to worship, if you can't try new things without the judgment and influence uh, of society more broadly, uh, you'll simply adopt whatever is popular or whatever the state religion is, uh, because that's all you can really try without being uh, disincentivized uh, by the judgment of others. And of course, even private property, right? Uh, you can't have anything for yourself. Uh, you are rather uh, a part of a collective uh, without privacy. And this, I, I think, is where we really start to get into the, the crux of the issue that we're seeing happen all across the internet today, uh, is that privacy has a stronger case the less power you wield within society. If you're an individual, if you're not harming anyone, if you're all by yourself, uh, you're not in public office, uh, you don't really have any influence over anything, you are the target audience for which privacy was designed. If you're a public official, uh, if you uh, enjoy an incredible amount of privilege and influence, uh, rather transparency is intended for you because it's the only way that we can hold you to the account of our standards, our laws, and be able to cast our votes in an informed way. Uh, and these things, I, I think, are, are often missed. But when you start to think about the dangers when we lose that, uh, when everything you've ever done on the Internet, every purchase you've ever made, everywhere you've ever traveled with a cell phone in your pocket is suddenly available uh, to third parties, those influences, that chilling effect, that judgment uh, begins to become a little bit more real, even if it's not being exercised. And at any point in time, at, during any change of government in the wake of any election, whether or not those capabilities actually are being used in a, a direct manner uh, can, change influ uh, can change instantly. You may be uh, completely supportive of whoever is in charge of the NSA or any other uh, intelligence service uh, today. But what about tomorrow? Um, I can see you spend your days thinking about these things, which is fair. I trust, are you writing a book about, a sort of more considered book about these issues? I think about it. Uh, the, the thing with that is I've been very concerned from the beginning uh, about making it very clear that I'm not profiting uh, from the actions that I took in 2013. Uh, yes, I speak as a means of survival uh, because people go, you know, how do you, how do you live? How do you pay your rent and things like that? Uh, would they rather I be working somewhere in Russia uh, or would they rather I be truly uh, and demonstrably independent? Uh, now that years have gone on and it's clear that I wasn't motivated by anything uh, other than my stated beliefs, which is to try to fix this problem and make things a little bit better, uh, not by directing what the direction of the future should be or saying, you know, this is how the law should change, but rather giving the public at least a chance, a say in the matter. Uh, maybe it is time, but I haven't begun yet, no. Um, you had said recently, I think, to Alan Rusbridger that you think of yourself as still working for the United States. Could you explain what you mean by that? Uh, the basic idea here is that being patriotic doesn't mean simply agreeing with your government. Uh, supporting your government and attempting to uh, defend their values doesn't mean simply saying, yes, okay, whatever you say. Uh, in fact, I would argue uh, that being willing uh, to disagree, particularly in a risky manner, uh, is actually what we need more of today. Uh, when we have this incredible, often uh, fact-free environment where politicians can simply make a claim and then it's reported, uh, without actually a critical analysis of what that means, what the effect would be, uh, how do we actually steer democracy? How do we actually sort of guide the boat? But if we have facts, uh, and if we have people who have actually worked with these capabilities, uh, who are also participating in their democracy, uh, maybe we can do a little bit better here. Uh, but I, I have to protest a little bit. Can we involve Ken a little bit more? Because he has an extraordinary amount of uh, expertise that I lack. 
you want to come in or are you okay? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. So, I mean, let me ask you this too. Um, there are lots of indications that the Russian government or hackers working with the Russian government or for the GRU, I mean, some of this is obviously fuzzy because, as you know, hackers can hide, um, have been involved in the hacking of the DNC emails um, and have basically published them through Julian Assange. And Julian Assange keeps saying there's more to come. Um, do you, does that make you uncomfortable sitting in Russia and do you sometimes feel, after all, you're a, a little bit there on their um, willingness? Do you find yourself, I, I know you've criticized them a bit, but do you find yourself self-censoring in what you say about Russia and its policies? Well, I, I think Ken has actually followed my statements on, on Russia. Uh, so to give him a, a question to answer here, uh, Ken, would you like to uh, sort of characterize my uh, positions or at least my public claims on these kind of issues? And your own beliefs, please. Yeah, no, I mean, Ed has been quite outspoken about, about Russia's invasions of privacy. And I think, you know, admirably so, because Russia is the only entity that stands between, you know, Ed and prison at this stage. And, and so, you know, I, I think that, you know, as he said, it's not his choice that he's there. The U.S. took away his passport when he was in the Russian airport. Um, and, and, you know, despite Putin being his host, Ed's been willing to speak out. I think one thing is, you know, if we bring up hacking, and, and maybe if I could just go back for a moment. The U.S. government, you know, claims a parade of, of horribles that have resulted from, from Snowden's disclosures. And, but when, you know, when you push them on this, there's very little specificity there. And, and the thing that they always come back to is that because of these disclosures, now everybody's encrypting. You know, you know, we, you know, we should, you know, look at this a little bit and analyze it because, you know, if you were a terrorist, you were taking measures through encryption and the like to avoid people listening in on your conversations anyhow. But what drives the U.S. government crazy now is that, you know, the, the major companies that we use as we operate on the internet or on our phone are now moving to default end-to-end -end encryption. Um, meaning that, you know, first of all, you are encrypted, and second, they are trying to take the key out of their own hands so that the government can't go to them surreptitiously and say, you know, here's a subpoena, give us those emails or give us, you know, the records of those conversations and don't tell the user, which is what they used to do. Um, now, you know, this understandably drives them crazy, but in a sense, it's their own fault. You know, by, by overstepping, they have, you know, gone so far in undermining our privacy that, you know, all of us which, who, you know, value our privacy, frankly want this end-to-end -end encryption. And, and, and this encryption is also, you know, the best antidote to the hacking. Because, you know, hacking is a real problem in today's world. You know, I, I, Human Rights Watch is a huge target of the Chinese, the Russians, everybody. And we, you know, put ridiculous amount of resources into trying to fight against that. And encryption's the key to this. Um, so, you know, I, I you know, frankly thank Mr. Snowden for alerting all of us to our vulnerability to this kind of hacking. And, and you know, we now are moving toward a better, hardly a complete, but a better defense against hacking. Um, so I just assume that your answer to whether you self-censor yourself in Russia is no, right? Yeah, no. I mean, the question here is not uh, whether I'm censoring myself about Russia, which should be clear because I've uh, made some very critical statements, uh, which certainly were not in my self-interest, uh, but I believe were the right thing to do. Uh, it's really more of where should my focus be? Uh, I'm not a fluent Russian speaker. Uh, it would be kind of crazy to expect that I would be. Uh, moreover, I am literally a former CIA agent. Uh, when you combine these things together, uh, the idea that I would have a lot of influence uh, in shaping uh, opinion in Russia, uh, well, it, it, it's kind of clear that that would not be uh, very effective. But in the United States, that's actually not the case. Uh, I am one of the only people who's recently worked with these uh, programs of mass surveillance directly uh, who is able uh, to comment on these openly. Uh, everyone else uh, in the United States, for one reason or another, 
uh, has their speech chilled either by fear of prosecution, uh, which would be the vast majority of individuals, uh, or because they, they want to comment anonymously to journalists or whatever, uh, they're, they're sort of pushing the official line. We don't have the other line. We don't have the independent line there. So I have a unique value uh, that I can provide to the conversation in the United States. Uh, but moreover, that's where my first loyalty lies, right? Uh, should I try to fix the rest of the world first, or should I try to fix my own country first? Um, this movie has just come out, um, and it was reviewed this morning, actually, um, by A.O. Scott in the New York Times. And I'm curious whether you recognize yourself. He said it portrays you as a nice, normal, humble guy, neither a zealot nor a megalomaniac. I mean, it, he basically describes you as very dull. Um, and I wondered how you see yourself. Do you recognize yourself in that? You know, I, I, I am what I am. Uh, I'm never going to be the coolest guy on the stage. Uh, but that's okay, you know, because that's not what I'm going for. Uh, as long as we can keep the internet free and open, uh, at least as much as possible, and we can improve things a little bit, bit by bit, uh, year over year, uh, and I can do the things that I enjoy, for example, my work at the Freedom of the Press Foundation, where I serve as director, uh, where we're trying to create new tools for journalists to protect their communications uh, from being used against them, uh, to identify them, to geolocate them, and unfortunately, in many cases, uh, to detain or kill them, as was the case of uh, Marie Colvin operating in Syria. Uh, I think this is a, a worthy cause that, that makes me feel good uh, about what I'm doing. Um, even if it doesn't get as much attention uh, as the things that I, I uh, am sort of best known for, uh, but even if it's a little bit nerdy, it's something that I enjoy very much and I'm very comfortable with. I, I hope you could hear the applause after you'd stopped. Um, you once described yourself as a Buddhist. Are you still a Buddhist, do you think? Uh, you know, this was in the... Uh, uh, and they had a giant of sort of describe your faith. Uh, and I didn't see a box that uh, mentioned agnostic. Uh, you know, I, I didn't want to go sort of full atheist on this one. Uh, but I, I didn't really want to put myself uh, in, a, in a big box like that either. Uh, so that was sort of what I could consider maybe something close to my spiritual beliefs. Uh, but I've never been a, a Buddhist in strict terms, uh, and I wouldn't describe myself that way today. Uh, the bottom line is that I'm not really sure uh, how things work. Uh, I'm open uh, to persuasion, but uh, for now, I, I guess my focus is on more earthly tasks. And I'm sure you're not the first person who's faced such a list of choices and rebelled. <laughs> um, I wanted to bring this to the audience a bit too. We have a big room here and a lot of people quite in interested. Um, and um, I think we have time for a couple questions. Um, can I see a hand? Um, there's a woman with her hand up there. Could you identify yourself also Hi. and then try to not make a comment but ask a question? Thank you. Hi, this is Lulu. I'm a journalist from China. It's a very simple question. A family in Hong Kong hosted you when you were there. I want to ask you if you are able to communicate with them afterwards and uh, do you know how they are doing these days? I haven't been able to communicate with them directly. No, uh, I have uh, been able to communicate with them uh, through the lawyer that represented us both. Uh, the only thing that I can say, though, is thank you. I mean, these were people, these were refugees uh, who had nothing. Uh, they were living in an incredibly precarious situation. They still are today. Uh, and despite that, when at the time the most wanted man in the world showed up on their doorstep, they didn't hesitate to open the door. Uh, they protected me. Uh, they believed in me. Uh, 
Uh, and but for that, I might have had a, a very different ending. Uh, so I think this is a central thing that I would like to, to turn over to Ken here, is that there's really something tragic about the idea that I, uh, who was charged by the most powerful government in the world with sort of this dinner plate full of crimes, uh, could finally receive asylum, uh, at least temporarily. Uh, right now, I have permanent residence as opposed to asylum. Uh, but three years later, these individuals, uh, who are legitimate refugees, uh, who have lived through torture, they've lived through human rights abuses, uh, still have not. What is wrong with our policies, with our structures for assessing uh, people who are legitimately fleeing very dangerous situations? that somebody with a high profile can be protected, but someone with a very worthy situation who's not well known cannot. Thanks, I, I'm gonna get killed by the organizer, but I'm gonna take two more questions, but I'm gonna take them all at once and then ask you to respond. So um, first, Margarita over there, and then this woman here. So if we can bring, bring the mic. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a German businesswoman and a professor of US foreign policy, and I have a very simple question as well. If I would imagine to join the German secret service, which I would never do, I would think this is a, not a girly camp, but a, a very dark, dark room. So I would more or less know what I would expect. And I would expect that they violate the laws as all, civil, uh, all intelligence services do. The Germans, the French, the Brits, the Americans, the Chinese, the Russians, and everybody else. So I have a question in terms of your credibility. Um, I think you're a perfect in investigative journalist. But wouldn't it, it have been much better, you would have said this, um, honestly that you went there to find out what you did, which I think is superb, but to pretend that you went there for another reason, I have really difficulties to believe. <laughs> well, it's important. And, uh, and, I mean, let's just, let's just wait for, for the second okay. question, oh, and then you can answer as you please. Dominique, okay? Uh, sorry, Dominique Lamoureux. Uh, and, then, oh. and then this, this woman. But go ahead. Okay, uh, so very quickly. Uh, it's quite it very interesting that we had exactly the same debate 2,000, more than 2,000 years ago here in Greece with Sophocle, theater play, and uh, with Antigone and Creo. And today, uh, Antigone is a, a war, and nobody, I think, will uh, support Creo. And I just want to know if Mr. Snowden believes he is Antigone. <laughs> yes, please. And identify yourself. Hi, I'm Alexandra Pascalido. I just want to ask you, will you vote at the American elections? And uh, what's your opinion about Trump and Hillary? Mr. Snowden, over to you. Okay, I'll answer the voting one uh, first because that's quickest. Uh, I will be voting, but as a privacy advocate, uh, I, I think it's very important for me to hold out for everyone else uh, that there should never be an obligation for an individual to discuss their vote. Uh, and I won't be doing uh, so with mine uh, simply to uphold that sort of standard. Uh, what I will say uh, about the candidates is I'm disappointed uh, that we're not hearing very much about the Constitution this election cycle. We're not hearing very much about our rights. We're not hearing very much about the values that we should be putting forth as a nation uh, that don't merely benefit this group or that group, but benefit all of us everywhere. Um, the question uh, on Antigone, uh, actually I'll, I'll kick to you, Ken, uh, to, to give you one that's a little bit more literary, uh, and then I'll, I'll take the final one after that. I mean, I don't think we, we necessarily need an answer, on an answer on Ken's version of Antigone, so why don't you just go ahead? <laughs> okay. Uh, on the last one, the, the thing is, uh, you know, I, I don't really believe that you went to the uh, the agencies or whatever for 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 uh, whatever reason with thinking it was okay. Uh, 
it's important to understand that I didn't start working uh, for the intelligence uh, agencies in 2013. Uh, I signed up for the U.S. Army in 2004. Uh, I was a very different person uh, at that age. Um, it took exposure uh, to many different things over a great deal of time uh, to actually influence my thinking uh, and make me question things that I had simply presumed uh, without really looking at. But there was a, a, a much deeper question sort of in, embedded uh, in one of the presumptions, uh, the premises of your question, which is that if you go to work for an intelligence agency, you expect that they break the law. You expect that that's all right. That's what they do. But is that always the case? And if it is, does it have to be? Uh, it's true that many intelligence services uh, do and have broken the law in the past. Uh, but we've also inherited uh, many of these policies of intelligence services from periods of total war, uh, where we're worried about uh, naval blockades, we're worried about infiltrators sabotaging our factories, uh, and things that are simply no threat today. And in any period of total war, uh, we see exceptions uh, to rights, uh, prohibitions uh, and infringements on our rights uh, routinely that we wouldn't justify in other times, uh, in other periods. I think we should look very closely uh, at the things that we accept as natural uh, from these groups, not just in historical contexts, but in the modern one. Uh, regardless of real threats, uh, for example, uh, the threat of transnational terrorism, uh, which does happen, we should remember that this sort of terrorism uh, was actually, more lives were lost to terrorism uh, in Western Europe in the 60s and the 70s and 80s uh, than they are in our decade today. Uh, the difference is whenever anything bad happens in any corner of the earth, it reaches every living room by the end of the day. Uh, we should be pragmatic, we should be realistic about the threats that we face, but we should not be fearful. Um, Ed, thank you, but before we go, um, I'd like to ask Ken to just make a little wrap up. Yeah, well, let me, let me just wrap up in terms of the themes of our conference here, because you know, I think as, as we think about what does democracy mean in the context of intelligence agencies, um, there is no you know, exception for intelligence agencies for the duty to apply the rule of law. Um, obviously, intelligence agencies need secrecy, but what we've seen, you know, frankly, in part through Mr. Snowden's disclosures, in part through the works of other whistleblowers, is that the oversight mechanisms were broken. You know, the FISA court that Ed referred to um, almost always says yes. The intelligence committees have been co-opted. The internal whistleblower procedures have actually led to retaliation and prosecution against the whistleblowers rather than their protection. And so what we had was effectively lawless agencies operating outside of rights, outside the rule of law. That's not what democracy is about. And I think that you know, the challenge for us is to maintain the degree of operational secrecy that intelligence agencies need, but to do that within real oversight so that we can meaningfully speak of democracy applying to all government agencies. Thank you, Ken Roth. Thank you, Edward Snowden. Thank you, the audience. And now to Achilles.